Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation. My name is Lukas Jäger and I'm presenting you my work on remote attestation extended to the analog domain. And I start with a brief introduction into the topic of trusted computing. What is trusted computing? It's a term that describes various techniques that enforce hardware and software systems to behave a certain way. Uh, most prominently, this is used to protect the integrity of software systems and uh, such trusted computing systems are usually anchored in some hardware root of trust. And the most widely available root of trust is the trusted platform module, the TPM, which you can see in the image on the slide. Uh, it's basically present in almost every modern laptop or computer. And a little less known root of trust is the device identifier composition engine. And based on these root of trusts, a number of techniques exist that makes sure the device's behavior is as expected. For example, secure boot, which will abort the booting sequence if um, manipulation of the firmware is detected, or measured boot that can measure a firmware and report its properties to a remote verifier, or for example, sealing, which will encrypt a piece of data so that only a firmware that wasn't tampered with can read it. Now, based on measured boot, we can construct a scheme of remote attestation. Remote attestation is the proof of certain properties to a remote verifier. And on this example slide, I've, I show you one that is based on DICE. DICE is a lightweight root of trust for embedded systems with constrained resources. And it has only two prerequisites. One of them is a piece of boot ROM that's executed after power up. And the other one is a piece of flash memory that can be made available only to the boot ROM. And every DICE architecture is a layered architecture. It's consisting of multiple layers of firmware, with DICE being the first one. DICE, in its function, does only one thing. It measures the next level of firmware and combines this measurement with a one-way function and the unique device secret that is stored in the protected flash memory to the compound device identifier, which is the proof of the device's identity. And with the measurement of the next layer, it also can prove the integrity of the next layer. This principle of de deriving compound device identifiers is applied to every other level of firmware after the first mutable code. And the top layer will use the CDI to derive an attestation key. Now, how does remote attestation work? Uh, usually, it's just a simple challenge response protocol between the verifier and the device, with the verifier creating a challenge nonce, sending it to the device, where it is uh, combined with the device's nonce, and uh, feed to a Mac for which the attestation key that we derived earlier is used. And the nonce and the Mac are then sent back to the verifier, which in its turn will compute the same Mac and compare if they are equal. And the key thing here is that K attestation is bound to the device's CDI, which is again a proof of its integrity and identity. And therefore, if the device could derive K attestation correctly, the verifier can uh, assume its firmware was not tampered with and its identity is correct too. Um, the question of my research is now, how can we extend this to hardware? Obviously, uh, this only extends to software, but hardware are increasingly becoming a target of attacks and therefore we ask ourselves, how can we extend this to hardware? The motivation behind this question is a number of rather simple attacks to hardware that can uh, break incredibly complex uh, trusted computing schemes. For example, a security firm called Pulse Security extracted a hard drive encryption keys from a TPM by merely performing the attack you can see in the image here, uh, attaching an attacker board to the communication lines between a TPM and the CPU and just uh, sniffing the keys. Of course, you could use encryption between the CPU and the TPM, but at this point, trusted computing has no way of knowing if there is an attacker present or not. And the idea was to create a fingerprint of the peripheral hardware, in this case, the TPM, that is analog in nature. So to measure some analog property of the TPM that can function as a kind of fingerprint, much like a hash. And the idea is to include such a fingerprint in existing trusted computing schemes to have uh, proof of not only the device's firmware integrity, but also of the integrity of its peripheral hardware. We've been searching for candidates for this fingerprint, and we found a candidate in the field of system characterization. It's a field of control technology, which tries to extract properties from control technology systems. And one of the simplest techniques to do that is the step response. Um, 
step response is a property of a system as shown in the image right in the circuit diagram. It has uh, two clamps where there is an input voltage and two clamps where there's an output voltage. And the step response is the output voltage that results from applying the step function to the input voltage. And the example you see in the right shows a low-pass filter system consisting of a resistor and a capacitor. And the resulting step response is a function that converges to the maximum voltage of 3.3 volts. And the rate of conversion or convergence is given by the parameter tau. And tau is the product of the resistance and the capacitance in this low-pass filter system. And if one can measure tau, one can determine the sizes of the resistor and the capacitor. And this is one of the most effective ways of determining the properties of a circuit in control technology. And our idea was to use that for our fingerprint. And we wanted to exploit various characteristics that are present in all circuitries. All circuitries have some parasitic capacitances in the picofarad area and some parasitic resistances in the mega ohm or giga ohm area and they can characterize a system. So we wanted to create a circuit, or we created a circuit that makes them visible. You can see the measurement circuit as an image in the right. Um, this is basically the image with the TPM before, but replaced with a very simple model. So CP here models the parasitic capacitances of the TPM and of the circuit board it's attached to, and RP models the parasitic resistances. Also, you can see the MOSI communication line between the CPU and the TPM from before. But we want to measure the characteristic of this uh, MOSI communication line. And for that purpose, we introduced two more lines that are attached to it. One is the test line. It's attached to pin 7 and it features the measurement resistor RM. And the other one is an internal ADC for the measurement of the step response. And the measurement resistor RM in combination with the parasitic capacitances and resistances creates a step response that is characteristic for the system and that we can measure. And RM has to be uh, dimensioned in a way that allows a meaningful measurement. So it should be large enough that the, deep, the low pass characteristic is visible and it should also consider the ADC sampling rate and resolution. This measurement circuit was then experimentally tested with three scenarios. One of the scenarios was a digital load that models a lot of digital peripherals like the TPM, for example, or also possible would be an SPI slave. And also a resistive load was tested with 25 mega ohm resistors and capacitive loads with a 100 nanofarad capacitor too. And each of these test scenarios was combined with three kinds of attackers. The active and passive attackers are given in the image on the top. Um, it's just what we've basically seen before with the TPM. Another microcontroller is introduced in the communication line and in the passive case just listens to the traffic happening on the communication line. And in the active case, actively jamming the communication and inserting own communication. And the circuitry change attacker is modeled by replacing the original digital peripheral with a less valuable one. Uh, this is the results for the digital load scenario. Uh, as I said, the ST microcontroller acts as the digital peripheral. And as the active attacker or passive attacker, an MSP430 was inserted listening or sending random data. And again, as a circuitry change attacker, an Arduino Uno was inserted instead of the ST microcontroller. And we can see all these attacks result in visible changes. The most obvious attack is uh, yeah, the active attacker because we can really see the communication pulse it's inserting. The other attackers have more or introduced more subtle changes to the step response, but they are also visible and detectable. So the passive attacker is the red curve and it's clearly differentiating from the unmodified curve. The circuitry change is a little more subtle to detect, but there is still a change we can see in the graphics. So we can see it, we should be able to detect it. Same goes for the resistive load. Um, here we used a 25 mega ohm resistor. And as a passive attacker, again, we introduced an MSP430 just listening. And as a circuitry change, we introduced or we replaced the 25 mega ohm resistor with one that only has 12.5 mega ohm. And again, the blue line uh, 
represents the unmodified scenario and we can see visible differences in all the modified scenarios. Now I've talked a lot about detection in the previous slides, detection of attacks, and the question is how do you do that in an analog scenario? For a firmware scenario this would be easy because you just compare the hash of the firmware with the hash of the unmodified firmware and if they are equal the firmware is unmodified. For analog values like the step response you cannot do that because they are always subject to noise and therefore we had to find a way of comparing step responses with each other in an analog domain and detecting attacks but also uh, not rejecting something due to noise and therefore we introduced the concept of distance measures in this case. Distance measures always compare two vectors of real numbers with each other and combine them or, com or extract a value of distance between the two vectors and if they are very different from each other the distance will be large and if they are very similar to each other the distance will be rather small. Our attack detection works by setting an acceptance threshold and if the distance between two vectors is below this value then we don't assume an attack and if it's beyond that value then an attack is very probable and we evaluated for candidates as a distance measure the Manhattan and the Euclidean distance, the cosine distance, and the root mean square error. And we evaluated these candidates by conducting multiple measurements and trying to find a threshold value which maximizes the accuracy. The accuracy is given by the true negative and the true positive added together and dividing that value by the number of total experiments done. And we could find a threshold value that made the accuracy 100% for all of the scenarios and all of the attackers and therefore we furthermore conducted an evaluation of the ranges for the acceptance threshold in the various scenario and of that I can give you a small excerpt on the right. This shows some uh, well, or the ranges from the digital scenario for each of the measures with a passive and a circuitry change attacker and for the passive attacker the range of a possible acceptance threshold is much larger which means it's far easier to detect which kind of is what we already saw in the in the curves that i show you and the ranges for the circuitry attacker are always very small which means it's kind of difficult to detect but you can still pick a value from the range and achieve an accuracy of 100 percent and since we reached 100% accuracy with all the detection mechanisms, we conducted a third evaluation and looked which one had the best runtime. And of the four, the Manhattan distance was the quickest because it has no root operations. It's a very simple algorithm. And therefore, for our demonstrator, we decided to implement the Manhattan distance. Now with the fingerprint measurement method and the distance comparison method present, we can deal with the question of how to integrate this into existing remote attestation schemes. Uh, the image on the right shows how we did this in an example implementation. It's based on the simple challenge response protocol that I showed in the beginning of this presentation. And the additions that were made here is that the device, once it gets a request to a test, uh, performs the fingerprint measurement for the analog circuitry. And this fingerprint is then included into the computation of the response MAC and uh, the fingerprint and the MAC are sent with a nonsense back to the server. And the server has then to verify the MAC as it did before, but also has to compare the measured analog fingerprint to a golden fingerprint of the device that it stored in a secure location. And if the distance between the fingerprint and the golden fingerprint is too large, then the verifier can assume that there was an attack to the device. This was all implemented on a Cortex-M0 based STM microcontroller that is very resource constrained and should show that this method is also implementable on, on very low end devices. And we also measured the runtime overhead that was introduced by this method. Uh, measuring 20 fingerprints for the computation of the analog fingerprint takes 240 additional milliseconds and averaging them into one analog fingerprint takes another 11 microseconds. These values can of course be adjusted by measuring fewer fingerprints, but in that case the noise resistance would decrease of course. Now that's the end of my presentation. Thanks everyone for listening and I'm now happy to answer your questions.